Hi, welcome back to the Coda podcast. I'm Ollie Flower. And I'm Roger Harris. Here's a podcast from our Coda 22 event, which I think we really feel it was our best content yet. It was our best event yet. And it was so good to see everyone back together again after such a long hiatus, right? <laughs> so good. It was friggin' awesome yeah. to be back together. Um, so much to be proud of. Agreed. Maybe our best content ever. And how about having a uh, climate active or Australian government climate active certified carbon neutral event. That's a first. It was one hell of an achievement that. Massive achievement and there'll be lots more on the website that you can track down about how we did that. So please go to the website, check out the other podcasts and video content, the YouTube channel um, and you can find us wherever you get your podcasts and do share it with your network, tag us on socials and spread the word because this is the last Coda event and it's been one hell of a ride. So thank you for everybody who's been part of it. Yeah, an absolute privilege to have been part of it. For more more on the sort of winding up of Coda, check out on the website and uh, hope to see you all soon. Um, we are fortunate to have for our final speaker, Dr. Greg Kelly. Uh, Greg is a paediatric intensivist uh, at Westmead Children's Hospital, and he runs the Paediatrica Intensiva podcast. I love that. It feels very... I hopefully got the accent right there. He's interested in complexity, how things work, how they fail, and how to make them better. And he recently completed an MBA uh, to make that impossible task a little easier. Fittingly, his talk today takes a novel view of individual patient care. Um, PICU patients are kind of complex enough as it is without the context around them. Um, so I'm really fascinated to hear what you've got to say, Greg. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle, for the really generous introduction, and thanks to Coda, firstly, for having me, but also for organising such an energised, connected and relevant conference for the world that we're finding ourselves in. Um, before I go on, I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the land of the Boon Wurrung and the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation on the banks of Birrung, the mighty Yarra River, the heart of Melbourne, and reiterate that it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So I've spent about the better part of 10 years, or a bit more than 10 years actually, thinking about really complex, long-term PICU patients. I've gone down a lot of alleys to try and understand them better. We've only got 15 minutes in this talk, so it's going to be a bit of a whistle-stop tour, and I'll tell you where we're going to go. First, we're going to meet a little girl called Abby, who's lived in our ICU for almost two years. Then we're going to talk about how Abby represents a very important group of patients who are a tiny fraction of our admissions, but a huge proportion of our workload, and who are complex in such a way that none of us can possibly know what to do with them. How we responded to that and how that might change how you respond to your patients when you go home next week. And then we're going to look at some data and a spreadsheet. Now, you probably weren't expecting that, and I wasn't either when I started uh, writing my talk, but despite all those alleys that I went down, it wasn't until I really started looking at our local data, and turning it into information that I began to understand, and the teams at two of the biggest ICUs in Australia also began to understand the problems that we were seeing every day and what we could do about them. All right, so uh, this photo was taken back in 2014 when I was a junior PICU consultant, and this is Abby, who I mentioned, she's three and a half. Very soon after the time of this photo, she was in a car with her mum, Tanya, and her siblings, Toby and James, and the car was T-boned, very severe accident, and they were all quite severely injured, Abby the most seriously. She suffered a C12 cervical spine fracture dislocation and a C2 cervical cord injury. She was intubated at the scene, airlifted to the trauma centre. Over the next couple of days, uh, the extent of her injuries were established. Her C-spine was decompressed and stabilised, and she began to wake up. This is uh, Tanya herself, quite severely injured as well, in a hospital bed which had been brought across to the PICU so that she could be with Abby as she woke up. Abby was moving her eyes, mouthing around the tube, but nothing below her head was moving. And at that point, it became apparent that she had a complete uh, C2 spinal cord level. Spinal cord uh, injuries of this level are exceedingly rare because the only people that survive are those that get immediate um, supported respiration. 
um, and they cause havoc with all the other issues of the body. Her care was very, very complex, and she spent the next two years in the ICU as she was getting established and stabilised on the technologies that she required to maintain life. When we started trying to get a home, there wasn't even a place for her to go, and we had to purchase a home in Brisbane and, and basically, literally, uh, build a mobile ICU around this patient, which could provide seamless, 24-7 delivery of care, as well as people who could monitor her and troubleshoot the technologies that she was critically dependent on for life. So Abby, oh, sorry about that. Abby is now 12, and when I spoke to her and her mum, Tanya, last week, um, she uh, is living at home with her family. She is attending a mainstream school, and she told me how excited she was to be going to high school next year. These are two very recent photos, one her really amazing uh, book week costume, and the other her special wheelchair with caterpillar tracks for the sand, which I thought was really great. So our, those, that two years that Abby spent in the ICU were, were diabolically difficult for her, her family, and our team. The most recent patient like her in, in the state had been more than 10 years ago. So it was not just that me, as her primary intensivist, had no experience in managing kids like this, it's that our entire system didn't. We truly did not know what to do. Our bigger problem, as we walked around the ICU, was that it was full of patients like Abby, but also nothing like Abby. And by that I mean other patients with enormous intersecting complexity, often in a setup that was unique uh, to that child and, and potentially unique in the world with some of the genetic syndromes. And we would have six, eight, ten, or even more of them at any one time. We're being forced to cancel our elective work, transfer patients interstate. Crucially, we were getting feedback from families and staff that things just really weren't good. And uh, this is actually a real photo of me hiding from my ward round, hoping that it's going to finish while I'm in the linen cupboard and just hoping that these problems will go away. So we, we knew it was bad. Um, we did, families did, but we were in it. And we were so deep in it and working so hard that we never really had time to get our heads above water and fix it. Frustratingly, because things were, were so chaotic, uh, the complications and the communication errors would pile up and make things even worse for our patients. We wanted to run away, but really what we needed to do was take a step back. So we went upstairs and shook a data person out of wherever data people are <laughs> and said, you know, we think there's a story in our data, can you help us make sense of it? Now, I just want to note that this is not a problem that's unique to any one centre or indeed to Australia. Professor Karen Chung, who's one of the world experts on these patients, probably done more than anyone to improve their care, said to me a few weeks ago, this population of chronically, critically ill kids bothers me a lot. I spend a lot of time thinking about them because I don't know what to do. None of us knew what to do. All right, so, some data. Now, I know what you're thinking. Firstly, God, brave, you know, brave guy showing data just before lunch. Secondly, you know, this is not new. We look at data all the time in healthcare, and it's true, we do. We collect and we scrutinize data, and we use it for registries, research, and those really boring monthly data meetings that we have where your eyes glaze over. But we have a curious oversight about using the data that we're collecting to, to apply to our everyday problems. And instead, what we tend to have, if your place is anything like mine, is we have long meetings where we have very emphatic few opinions about what should be done to fix that person's perceived vision of the problem. We don't look at our data like this, and there's a reason, because right now, it's just data. It doesn't tell a story. We need instead to turn it into information. And the reason why I'm going to show you this is because, as I said, it really changed the way that I saw these patients, the teams at two of the biggest ICUs in the country saw the patients, and I'm going to actually show you quickly what we did rather than just tell you, because I want you to move away from this idea that you need to be an Excel wizard or have a machine learning degree in order to make sense of the data, turn the data that you have into information. All you need is Google and Excel. So here we go. I've anonymized this data um, and compressed some of the columns just to show what's relevant. Orange is length of stay, and there's some basic um, analytics that you'll probably get at your shop, you know, mortality rate, what your census is. But actually, we care about patients who stay longer than seven days. 
Now, it would take me you know, hours to count uh, only the links that stay above seven, but I can just put a natural language query into Excel. Excel count above value. This is me doing it in real time. And it says count if. So there I go, put that in. I only want to count the length of stay that's above seven days. Uh, the number who stay, rather. We had about 200 kids in the year of the 1,400 or so. Again, it would take me uh, a huge amount of time to add up that column with a calculator, and I would definitely make an error. But Excel can add it up only if it's above a certain value. And again, natural language query about how I would do that. And that's sum if. And we see here that, well, it looks like a pretty high number of bed days as it comes out. Wow. So all of a sudden, this data is starting to turn into information. We see that 15% of our patients are actually almost two-thirds of our bed days, and the average length of stay is more than five times longer than our all-comers. Now, we were interested in patients like Abby, so I've done the analysis here for those who stay longer than 28 days. A tiny fraction of our patients, 2.3%, but who used almost 30% of our bed days. So these were the two, the two revelations that, that I got from looking at that very simple data analysis. So when I walked out of the office after doing this analysis, the ICU looked completely different. I'm not going to say it was a full matrix moment, but it was pretty close. Because straight away, I could see why the ICU was full of a small minority of patients. I knew that 85% of our patients came in and out within a week, but they were only a third of our beds. There were hardly any of them. They, they were in and out so quickly, I barely saw them. Whereas that small minority, the 15% that stayed longer than a week, were actually occupying two-thirds of our bed day. And there was also this crucial population, uh, represented by Abby and other children like her, who stayed longer than 28 days, who were only 2% of our patients, but represented 28% of our work. So what happened is that data had become information. When we took this back to our team and to the families, we had answers to their questions and complaints. The unit is heaving because of the patients who stay a long time. What's the plan? I don't know what the plan is. Well, that's because the consultant changes twice a week. Communication sucks. Well, it, it does, because when you're here for two months, you outlast so many shift changes, so many communication styles, that you're really going to feel uh, the differences and the, the inconsistencies in that. So when, when, oh, sorry, I just rewind that. when data becomes information, we can see clearly, and that's what we were doing. But to know what to do, information needs to become knowledge. And in order for information to become knowledge, we need to have a conversation with it. Now, that sounds a bit touchy-feely, so you could also say that we need to take the information back to the original problem, which is what we did. And we had a three-way conversation between it, our teams, and the families. Now, the changes that we made, like the analysis that we did, were really simple. So I don't want you to be tricked by thinking, oh, this is just too simple to make a difference. They were simple changes, but they were informed by a much deeper understanding of the problems that we were seeing. We saw, so the first thing we did was that we simply identified these patients as a separate group, and that made a huge difference. We could go, oh, that's a long-stay patient. Families really appreciated being identified as a different group that had potentially different needs and required different resources. We saw that continuity was poor. So we set up a long-term patient meeting every week, and we established a nurse-led continuity model that didn't change with the weekly or twice-weekly ICU shift changes. Crucially, when we were going to management asking for these extra resources, we had very clear information about who the patients were, how many there were, and why it was needed. Now, when we did this analysis in Brisbane in 2015, we were in a brand new hospital. It had 36 beds, and it had six beds for long-term patients. They were in a back corridor with no light, they were tiny rooms, and no windows, clearly inappropriate for these patients who we knew stayed a long time, were often awake, and were technology dependent, so needed a lot of technologies. Fortunately, when we did the analysis in Sydney in 2020, we hadn't built the new hospital yet. We were well underway, we'd done the design, there were pretty complex plans drawn up. 
We had 45 beds, there were 15 bed pods, and there were two beds per pod for long-term patients. But again, with this new information at hand, we could instantly see that that was totally uh, not suited to, to the numbers we were already seeing. And that was a major reason for a redesign of the ICU to smaller 12 bed pods with four beds or one third beds per pod allocated to long-term patients. We pushed them out to the edges of the building where the patients had access to better natural light, more outdoor areas, and were further away from the acute areas of the ICU because the families were telling us that their kids were being traumatized with all the horrible things that they saw happening to other kids in their two month, three month or longer admissions. And this is what our new IC looks like. So this is a, a $700 million building where the plans got completely changed because of some very simple attempts to turn some data into information. Oh. So, as I said, I've spent longer than 10 years thinking about these patients, worrying about them, uh, and thinking about how we can do better. And I've arrived at a point where I have a few thoughts. The first is that, at best, all we have for these really complex patients are our educated guesses. They could be very educated guesses, but often no one on Earth can truly know how all of these things are going to interact in this child with that technology that's supporting them, with that family and social situation at this time in history. Daniel talked about how a lot of his service is helping patients navigate the health system, and I think that's what we were doing here. We had context, connections, and resources, but the family had details about their child and their family that we could never know. And it was only in a respectful dialogue with them that we could move things forward. With respect to data and stories, stories are powerful. Uh, they touch us. But we're inclined to dismiss them. You know, we say it's anecdata. It's N of one. Data's dry. It's not going to convince anyone. But if we can turn our data into information and then join that information with our stories, then we can tell a more accurate story about the pain that we're feeling, at we and our patients are feeling. And we can tell a new and better story about how things might be different. Thank you.